He is also the founder of Boston Dynamics. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mark Raybert. I am so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You know, it's, uh, I love robotics. And it's currently a very special time in robotics. Robots haven't ever been as exciting and as successful and as able as they are today. We still have a ways to go, but I am really enthused by all the stuff that's going on. And I'm gonna, today I'm gonna show you a little bit about what's going on. But first I wanna say, uh, you know, in the lobby of the hotel this morning, I bumped into someone I knew and they said, so Mark, are you gonna talk about robots or are you gonna talk about AI? Since I have a robot hat and an AI hat. And in my mind, there's no difference between the two. Robotics is the embodied sign, side of AI. It's the part of AI where you have a physical system, like a person is a physical system, and it's the interaction between the intelligence and the physical system that really makes it uh, new and exciting. And I think this technology has an opportunity not only to increase productivity around the world, I think many times we focus on productivity as the main goal of um, robots because they could do work uh, in factories and warehouses and places like that. But I think that robotics also, robotics and AI also offer the potential to uh, free people from doing dull, dirty, dirty and dangerous work like many people have to do. I think as Andrew just said, there's a chance for robotics really to solve problems. Yes, I'm sure that as we develop things it will create problems, but I think that there's a huge opportunity, really a bigger one, to solve humanity's problems using AI and robotics. And I hope that can stay in the viewfinder over the course of the day and the follow-up meetings and we uh, keep that balance between opportunity and risk uh, in mind. So with that, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about robots. I already said um, that I think that robotics and AI are really one thing, um, but there are kind of two parts to the solutions. One part has to do with the physicality of making robots do interesting things like get mobility and dexterity and perception and that real-time interaction. And there's an important role that we've made a lot of progress on. And then the newer part, the one that's sort of caught up in this recent wave of foundation models and generative AI, is making the robots smarter. Because to be honest, most robots today, while they might be physically able, and in some cases physically able like a person, they're still pretty stupid. And it takes a lot of work to program them and tell them what you want them to do. So I think there's an opportunity for advancing on that front, and I'll say a couple of words about that. So I'm just gonna show you so much is going on today in robotics. Uh, that robot in the bottle, bottom in the middle is a Boston Dynamics robot. There's about 1,500 of them around the world, and I'll show a little clip of some of the work that that robot's doing. But recently, there's just been a uh, springing out of other robot companies building quadruped robots. Uh, this, one, this one here has wheels on the legs. This is a little small one that's affordable but for researchers at universities uh, and things like that. Um, and uh, it, it's just very exciting to go from uh, the research lab into commercialization where lots and lots of people are getting interested. In humanoids, it's even more so, and, which is amazing, because I think that the humanoid robots still have a ways of go, to go before they're gonna be really practical for doing work. On the other hand, there's dozens of companies trying to build humanoid robot products. These are uh, five in uh, North America, and uh, here's four or five more in Asia, and uh, I'm told by people uh, at some of these factories at some of these uh, companies that they expect by the end of the year to be maybe a hundred companies building humanoid robots, even though essentially none of them have done useful work yet. So what an exciting time that there's so much enthusiasm, so much funding, so much opportunity, 
and all we have to do is uh, make it work. So I'm going to show a couple of clips. This is some of the things that uh, the, this quadruped robot built by Boston Dynamics is being used for. That was an oil rig where it's very expensive having people, uh, and this is a refinery where because of its advanced mobility, the robot can carry sensors and do routine inspections that are really aren't getting done enough in order to make sure the place works right. This is at a power generation facility where you can't have humans while they're operating. This is an integrated circuit factory in uh, Vermont um, where the robots used to make sure that equipment doesn't fail uh, before it gets repaired and diagnosed. And uh, they can be used to build digital twins that allow uh, automation and, and uh, measuring progress. And they're also being used at nuclear facilities. These were some experiments done at Chernobyl uh, a couple of years ago uh, in order to do radiation measurements where it was too dangerous to send people. And I'm really delighted that SPOT helped uh, the Japanese people who were uh, rehabilitating or um, I guess they were decommissioning the uh, reactors at Fukushima in order to get into reactor four that hadn't been entered for 11 years after the disaster and it was able to go up some stairs, open some doors so that they could get some data about the status uh, of that reactor. So there's just a, a big variety. There's dozens and dozens of applications that robots like this can be used for. Uh, this is sort of a clip that shows some of the athleticism in a robot uh, that uh, Boston Dynamics built. This is the Atlas robot. Many of you have probably seen these clips on YouTube. And uh, this is designed to show the dynamic control of the robot, uh, AI that's doing perception on the environment, navigation, and tasks like that. But more recently, we've started working on things that are more like applications. So here's the robot is selecting parts from fixtures, uh, doing navigating in the workshop there, lining them up on tables. Some of these parts are car parts. In order to do this, the robot has to be able to control its body. It uses cameras to have visual perception. It has to do de dexterity where it uses its hands in order to grasp the parts and manipulate them. Here, the robot's using its strength to lift uh, this wheel rim, which is pretty heavy, and uh, it's able to take it and place it on the table. And this next shot is going to show a task that's very similar to one that goes on in car factories called sequencing, where actual car parts are selected from single skew, and then they're prepared in order to be used by people who are going to assemble the vehicles once the car comes down the assembly line. So, you know, this isn't ready to go into a factory today, but it's not hard to imagine that in a very short time, we'll be able to get the speed and the performance up so that this thing could be used in order to do work and uh, increase productivity uh, and things like that. And then Boston Dynamics recently showed this new version of their Atlas robot. Uh, this is the only clip that's been out there so far but it's a very unique design and it's got a, a huge potential and I can't wait until uh, we can bring one here on the stage and uh, show you all what it can do. So it's not hard to imagine with that starting point that someday we'll have factories and warehouses that have all these robots working together along with people uh, doing things like keeping track of all the parts that go into uh, an assembly, uh, manipulate those parts, locomote with those parts, handle some parts the humans can't handle because the robot's stronger, and then use what's become more traditional robotics in order to assemble those things into products. Now I said I was going to talk a little bit not only about the athletic side of things, and most of what I just showed is on the athletic side, but what about the cognitive side, meaning making robots smarter? To do each of those demonstrations required a whole room of ver very skilled programmers and engineers in order to analyze the task, weeks and months of programming in order to get the robots to do each task. Well, we're imagining a day 
when you can teach the robot to do things the way we would teach you to do things, on-the-job training, where you say to the robot, go watch that man do his job, understand what you see him doing, and then do it yourself. Now, I don't have time to unpack that watch, understand, do. There's a lot there, but we have uh, groups at the AI Institute working on uh, attacking this problem and, and coming up with solutions and doing laboratory work to demonstrate results. Here's the robot doing the task. Oop. And uh, here's a domestic version of that task. You know, uh, I don't know how many of us watched our, our parents cooking a meal and then figuring out how to do it themselves, determining the, the dexterity skills that are required, the navigation, the ingredients, and all that kind of stuff. But that's part of the thing, too. This is a good example of separating the application from the technology. I believe that technology for Watch, Understand, Do will be applicable to all kinds of domestic, consumer, industrial, safety applications. This is the next step after that, inspect, diagnose, fix. Right now, Spot is in a factory that looks just like that, collecting data from robots, but humans analyze the data and then humans figure out how to repair the machines. But I don't see any reason why, by combining the kind of generative models that Andrew was talking about with the physicality of the robots, we can't have robots diagnosing the machines themselves, figuring out how to repair them, and then eventually repairing them. Now, this is still science fiction today. It's going to take some more investment and years and innovation before we get there. But uh, I'm really excited about being on that path. Here's the domestic version of inspect, diagnose, fix. And then finally, I'll mention uh, what I, we call help. Uh, some people look at this picture and say, oh, you want robots to help your uh, elderly and disabled people? But I think this is a, could be a real boon to humanity to have more help in the homes, not be so dependent on uh, our children or on uh, strangers taking care of our loved ones. And uh, my expectation is that people will welcome this technology once it's safe enough and available enough uh, to actually use. And we have a plan to do a simpler version of help. I get email all the time from people in wheelchairs who would like to go out on a hike out in the woods. And I think, I think it's possible to take something like those legged robots uh, and build a machine that uh, could take someone out uh, on a hiking trail. Maybe not stepping stones across the, uh, across the river on the first case, but uh, eventually I hope to get there. And I just want to close with one more comment about creativity. I think that, that AI and robotics is a huge opportunity and driver for creativity. Not only is, the, is there the creativity of the engineers who design these systems, who test them, who build them, but eventually the robots themselves and the AI itself will have creativity. I mean, Andrew stole my thunder a little bit by doing a real-time demo of, of an AI-generated song. Here's a uh, one that we had humans program. But I don't think we should lose sight of this aspect of the whole endeavor, that it's an opportunity for people and machines to be creative. Eventually, I want to come back here with robots and humans dancing together to live music, maybe live music that's being created by a mixture of uh, people and uh, robots. And uh, I think there's a great, rich future uh, from this kind of work. So thank you for listening.